chapter twenty one of the soul of a people this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the soul of a people by harold fielding chapter twenty one all life is one i heard a voice that cried balder the beautiful is dead is dead and through the misty air passed like the mournful cry of sunward sailing cranes tegner's Droppa. all romance has died out of our woods and hills in england all our fairies are dead long ago knowledge so far has brought us only death later on it will bring us a new life it is even now showing us how this may be and is bringing us face to face again with nature and teaching us to know and understand the life that there is about us science is telling us again what we knew long ago and forgot that our life is not apart from the life about us but of it everything is akin to us and when we are more accustomed to this knowledge when we have ceased to regard it as a new strange teaching and know that we are but seeing again with clearer eyes what a half knowledge blinded us to then the world will be bright and beautiful to us as it was long ago but now all is dark there are no dryads in our trees nor nymphs among the reeds that fringe the river even our peaks hold for us no guardian spirit that may take the reckless trespasser and bind him in a rock for ever and because we have lost our belief in fairies because we do not now think that there are goblins in our caves because there is no spirit in the winds nor voice in the thunder we have come to think that the trees and the rocks the flowers and the storm are all dead things they are made up we say of materials that we know they are governed by laws that we have discovered and there is no life anywhere in nature and yet this cannot be true far truer is it to believe in fairies and in spirits than in nothing at all for surely there is life all about us who that has lived out alone in the forest that has lain upon the hillside and seen the mountains clothe themselves in lustrous shadows shot with crimson when the day dies who that has heard the sigh come up out of the ravines where the little breezes move that has watched the trees sway their leaves to and fro beckoning to each other with wayward amorous gestures but has known that these are not dead things watch the stream coming down the hill with a flash and a laugh in the sunlight look into the dark brown pools in the deep shadows beneath the rocks or voyage a whole night upon the breast of the great river drifting past ghostly monasteries and silent villages and then say if there be no life in the waters if they too are dead things there is no consolation like the consolation of nature no sympathy like the sympathy of the hills and streams and sympathy comes from life there is no sympathy with the dead when you are alone in the forest all this life will come and talk to you if you are quiet and understand there is love deep down in the passionate heart of the flower as there is in the little quivering honeysucker flitting after his mate as there was in romeo long ago there is majesty in the huge brown precipice greater than ever looked from the face of a king all life is one the soul that moves within you when you hear the deer call to each other far above in the misty meadows of the night is the same soul that moves in everything about you no people who have lived much with nature have failed to describe this they have recognized the life they have felt the sympathy of the world about them and to this life they have given names and forms as they would to friends whom they loved fairies and goblins fauns and spirits these are but names and personifications of a real life but to him who has never felt this life who has never been wooed by the trees and hills these things are but foolishness of course to the burman not less than to the greek of long ago all nature is alive the forest and the river and the mountains are full of spirits whom the burmans call gnats there are all kinds of gnats good and bad great and little male and female now living round about us some of them live in the trees especially in the huge fir tree that shades half an acre without the village 
or among the fern-like fronds of the tamarind and you will often see beneath such a tree raised upon poles or nestled in the branches a little house built of bamboo and thatch perhaps two feet square you will be told when you ask that this is the house of the tree gnat flowers will be offered sometimes and a little water or rice maybe to the gnat never supposing that he is in need of such things but as a courteous and graceful thing to do for it is not safe to offend these gnats and many of them are very powerful there is a gnat of whom i know whose home is in a great tree at the crossing of two roads and he has a house there built for him and he is much feared he is such a great gnat that it is necessary when you pass his house to dismount from your pony and walk to a respectful distance if you haughtily ride past trouble will befall you a friend of mine riding there one day rejected all the advice of his burmese companions and did not dismount and a few days later he was taken deadly sick of fever he very nearly died and had to go away to the straits for a sea trip to take the fever out of his veins it was a very near thing for him that was in the burmese times of course after that he always dismounted but all gnats are not so proud nor so much to be feared as this one and it is usually safe to ride past even as i write i am under the shadow of a tree where a gnat used to live and the headman of the village has been telling me all about it this is a government rest-house on a main road between two stations and is built for government officials travelling on duty about their districts to the west of it is a grand fig-tree of the kind called nyang bin by the burmese it is a very beautiful tree though now a little bare for it is just before the rains but it is a great tree even now and two months hence it will be glorious it was never planted the headman tells me but came up of itself very many years ago and when it was grown to full size a gnat came to live in it the gnat lived in the tree for many years and took great care of it no one might injure it or any living creature near it so jealous was the gnat of his abode and the villagers built a little gnat house such as i have described under the branches and offered flowers and water and all things went well with those who did well but if any one did ill the gnat punished him if he cut the roots of the tree the gnat hurt his feet and if he injured the branches the gnat injured his arms and if he cut the trunk the gnat came down out of the tree and killed the sacrilegious man right off there was no running away because as you know the headman said gnats can go a great deal faster than any man many men careless strangers who camped under the tree and then abused the hospitality of the gnat by hunting near his home came to severe grief but the gnat has gone now alas the tree is still there but the gnat has fled away these many years i suppose he didn't care to stay said the headman you see that the english government officials came and camped here and didn't fear the gnats they had fowls killed here for their dinner and they sang and shouted and they shot the green pigeons who ate his figs and the little doves that nested in his branches all these things were an abomination to the gnat who hated loud rough talk and abuse and to whom all life was sacred so the gnat went away the headman did not know where he was gone but there are plenty of trees he has gone somewhere to get peace the headman said somewhere in the jungle where no one ever comes save the herd boy and the deer he will be living in a tree though i do not think he will easily find a tree so beautiful as this the headman seemed very sorry about it and so did several villagers who were with him and i suggest that if the gnat houses were rebuilt and flowers and water offered the gnat might know and return i even offered to contribute myself that it might be taken as an amende honorable on behalf of the english government but they did not think this would be any use no gnat would come where there was so much going and coming so little care for life such a disregard for pity and for peace if we were to take away our rest-house well then perhaps after a time something could be done but not under present circumstances and so besides dethroning the burmese king and occupying his golden palace we are ousting from their pleasant homes the guardian spirits of the trees they flee before the cold materialism of our belief before the brutality of our manners the headman did not say this he did not mean to say this for he is a very courteous man and a great friend of all of us but that is what it came to i think 
the trunk of this tree is more than ten feet through not a round bowl but like the pillar in a gothic cathedral as of many smaller bowls growing together and the roots spread out into a pedestal before entering the ground the trunk does not go up very far at perhaps twenty-five feet above the ground it divides into a myriad of smaller trunks not branches till it looks more like a forest than a single tree it is full of life still though the pigeons and the doves come here no longer there are a thousand other birds flitting to and fro in their aerial city and chirping to each other two tiny squirrels have just run along a branch nearly over my head in a desperate hurry apparently their tails cocked over their backs and a sky-blue chameleon is standing on the trunk near where it parts there is always a breeze in this great tree the leaves are always moving and there is a continuous rustle and murmur up there a mango tree and tamarind near by are quite still not a breath shakes their leaves they are as still as stone but the shadow of the fig tree is chequered with ever-changing lights is the gnat really gone perhaps not perhaps he is still there still caring for his tree only shy now and distrustful and therefore no more seen whole woods are enchanted sometimes and no one dare enter them such a wood i know far away north near the hills which is full of gnats there was a great deal of game in it for animals sought shelter there and no one dared to disturb them not the villagers to cut firewood nor the girls seeking orchids nor the hunter after his prey dared to trespass upon that enchanted ground what would happen i asked once if any one went into that wood would he be killed or what and i was told that no one could tell what would happen only that he would never be seen again alive the gnats would confiscate him they said for intruding on their privacy but what they would do to him after the confiscation no one seemed to be quite sure i asked the official who was with me a fine handsome burman who had been with us in many fights whether he would go into the wood with me but he declined at once enemies are one thing gnats are quite another and a very much more dreadful thing you can escape from enemies as witness my companion who had been shot at times without number and had only once been hit in the leg but you cannot escape gnats once he told me there were two very sacrilegious men hunters by profession only more abandoned than even the majority of hunters and they went into this wood to hunt they didn't care for gnats they said they didn't care for anything at all apparently they were absolutely without reverence worse than any beast said my companion so they went into the wood to shoot and they never came out again a few days later their bare bones were found flung out upon the road near the enchanted wood the gnats did not care to have even the bones of such scoundrels in their wood and so thrust them out that was what happened to them and that was what might happen to us if we went in there we did not go though the gnats of the forest will not allow even one of their beasts to be slain the gnats of the rivers are not so exclusive i do not think fish are ever regarded in quite the same light as animals it is true that a fervent buddhist will not kill even a fish but a fisherman is not quite such a reprobate as a hunter in popular estimation and the gnats think so too for the gnat of a pool will not forbid all fishing you must give him his share you must be respectful to him and not offend him and then he will fill your nets with gleaming fish and all will go well with you if not of course you will come to grief your nets will be torn and your boat upset and finally if obstinate you will be drowned a great arm will seize you and you will be pulled under and disappear for ever a gnat is much like a human being if you treat him well he will treat you well and conversely courtesy is never wasted on men or gnats at least so a burman tells me the highest gnats live in the mountains the higher the gnat the higher the mountain and when you get to a very high peak indeed like main thong peak in wantho you encounter very powerful gnats they tell a story of main thong peak and the gnats there how all of a sudden one day in eighteen eighty five strange noises came from the hill high up on his mighty side was heard the sound of great guns firing slowly and continuously there was the thunder of falling rocks cries as of some one bewailing a terrible calamity and voices calling from the precipices the people living in their little hamlets about his feet were terrified something they knew had happened of most dire import to them some catastrophe which they were powerless to prevent which they could not even guess 
but when a few weeks later there came even into those remote villages the news of the fall of mandalay of the surrender of the king of the great treachery they knew that this was what the nats had been sorrowing over all the nats everywhere seemed to have been distressed at our arrival to hate our presence and to earnestly desire our absence they are the spirits of the country and of the people and they cannot abide a foreign domination but the greatest place for nats is the popa mountain which is an extinct volcano standing all alone about midway between the river and the shan mountains it is thus very conspicuous having no hills near it to share its majesty and being in sight from many of the old capitals it is very well known in history and legend it is covered with dense forest and the villages close about are few at the top there is a crater with a broken side and a stream comes flowing out of this break down the mountain probably it was the denseness of its forests the abundance of water and its central position more than its guardian gnats that made it for so many years the last retreating place of the half robber half patriot bands that made life so uneasy for us but the gnats of popa mountains are very famous when any foreigner was taken into the service of the king of burma he had to swear an oath of fidelity he swore upon many things and among them were included all the gnats and popa no burman would have dared to break an oath sworn in such a serious way as this and they did not imagine that any one else would it was and is a very dangerous thing to offend the popa gnats for they are still there in the mountain and every one who goes there must do them reverence a friend of mine a police officer who was engaged in trying to catch the last of the robber chiefs who hid near popa told me that when he went up the mountain shooting he too had to make offerings some way up there is a little valley dark with overhanging trees and a stream flows slowly along it it is an enchanted valley and if you look closely you will see that the stream is not as other streams for it flows uphill it comes rushing into the valley with a great display of foam and froth and it leaves in a similar way tearing down the rocks and behaving like any other boisterous hill rivulet but in the valley itself it lies under a spell it is slow and dark and has a surface like a mirror and it flows up hill there is no doubt about it any one can see it when they came here my friend tells me they made a halt and the burmese hunters with him unpacked his breakfast he did not want to eat then he said but they explained that it was not for him but for the gnats all his food was unpacked cold chicken and tinned meats and jam and eggs and bread and it was spread neatly on a cloth under a tree then the hunters called upon the gnats to come and take anything they desired while my friend wondered what he should do if the gnats took all his food and left him with nothing but no gnats came although the burmans called again and again so they packed up the food saying that now the gnats would be pleased at the courtesy shown to them and that my friend would have good sport presently they went on leaving however an egg or two and a little salt in case the gnats might be hungry later and true enough it was that they did have good luck at other times my friend says when he did not observe this ceremony he saw nothing to shoot at all but on this day he did well the former history of all gnats is not known whether they have had a previous existence in another form and if so what is a secret that they usually keep carefully to themselves but the history of the popa gnats is well known every one who lives near the great hill can tell you that for it all happened not so long ago how long exactly no one can say but not so long that the details of the story have become at all clouded by the mists of time they were brother and sister these popa gnats and they had lived away up north the brother was a blacksmith and he was a very strong man he was the strongest man in all the country the blow of his hammer on the anvil made the earth tremble and his forge was as the mouth of hell no one was so much feared and so much sought after as he and as he was strong so his sister was beautiful beyond all the maidens of the time their father and mother were dead and there was no one but those two the brother and sister so they loved each other dearly and thought of no one else the brother brought home no wife to his house by the forge he wanted no one while he had his sister there and when lovers came wooing to her singing amorous songs in the amber dusk she would have nothing to do with them so they lived there together he growing stronger and she more beautiful every day till at last a change came 
the old king died and a new king came to the throne and orders were sent about to all the governors of provinces and other officials that the most beautiful maidens were to be sent down to the golden city to be wives to the great king so the governor of that country sent for the blacksmith and his sister to his palace and told them there what orders he had received and asked the blacksmith to give his sister that she might be sent as queen to the king we are not told what arguments the governor used to gain his point but only this that when he failed he sent the girl in unto his wife and there she was persuaded to go there must have been something very tempting to one who was but a village girl in the prospect of being even one of the lesser queens of living in the palace the centre of the world so she consented at last and her brother consented and the girl was sent down under fitting escort to find favour in the eyes of her king but the blacksmith refused to go it was no good the governor saying such a great man as he must come to high honour in the golden city it was useless for the girl to beg and pray him to come with her he always refused so she sailed away down the great river and the blacksmith returned to his forge as the governor had said the girl was acceptable in the king's sight and she was made at last one of the principal queens and of all she had most power over the king they say she was most beautiful that her presence was as soothing as shade after heat that her form was as graceful as a young tree and the palms of her hands were like lotus blossoms she had enemies of course most of the other queens were her enemies and tried to do her harm but it was useless telling tales of her to the king for the king never believed and she walked so wisely and so well that she never fell into any snare but still the plots never ceased there was one day when she was sitting alone in the garden pavilion with the trees making moving shadows all about her that the king came to her they talked for a time and the king began to speak to her of her life before she came to the palace a thing he had never done before but he seemed to know all about it nevertheless and he spoke to her of her brother and said that he the king had heard how no man was so strong as this blacksmith the brother of the queen the queen said it was true and she talked on and on and praised her brother and babbled of the days of her childhood when he carried her on his great shoulder and threw her into the air catching her again she was delighted to talk of all these things and in her pleasure she forgot her discretion and said that her brother was wise as well as strong and that all the people loved him never was there such a man as he the king did not seem very pleased with it all but he said only that the blacksmith was a great man and that the queen must write to him to come down to the city that the king might see him of whom there was such great report then the king got up and went away and the queen began to doubt and the more she thought the more she feared she had not been acting wisely in talking as she did for it is not wise to praise any one to a king she went away to her own room to consider and to try if she could hear of any reason why the king should act as he had done and desire her brother to come to him to the city and she found out that it was all a plot of her enemies herself they had failed to injure so they were now plotting against her through her brother they had gone to the king and filled his ear with slanderous reports they had said that the queen's brother was the strongest man in all the kingdom he was cunning too they said and very popular among all the people and he was so puffed up with pride now that his sister was a queen that there was nothing he did not think he could do they represented to the king how dangerous such a man was in a kingdom that it would be quite easy for him to raise such rebellion as the king could hardly put down and that he was just the man to do such a thing nay it was indeed proved that he must be disloyally plotting something or he would have come down with his sister to the city when she came but now many months had passed and he never came clearly he was not to be trusted any other man whose sister was a queen would have come and lived in the palace and served the king and become a minister instead of staying up there and pretending to be a blacksmith the king's mind had been much disturbed by this for it seemed to him that it must be in part true and he went to the queen as i have said and his suspicions had not been lulled by what she told him so he had ordered her to write to her brother to come down to the palace the queen was terrified when she saw what a mistake she had made and how she had fallen into the trap of her enemies but she hoped that the king would forget and she determined that she would send no order to her brother to come but the next day the king came back to the subject and asked her if she had yet sent the letter and she said no 
the king was very angry at this disobedience to his orders and he asked her how it came that she had not done as he had commanded and sent a letter to her brother to call him to the palace then the queen fell at the king's feet and told him all her fears that her brother was sent for only to be imprisoned or executed and she begged and prayed the king to leave him in peace up there in his village she assured the king that he was loyal and good and would do no evil the king was rather abashed that his design had been discovered but he was firm in his purpose he assured the queen that the blacksmith should come to no harm but rather good and he ordered the queen to obey him threatening her that if she refused he would be sure that she was disloyal also and there would be no alternative but to send and arrest the blacksmith by force and punish her the queen too then the queen said that if the king swore to her that her brother should come to no harm she would write as ordered and the king swore so the queen wrote to her brother and abjured him by his love to her to come down to the golden city she said she had dire need of him and she told him that the king had sworn that no harm should come to him the letter was sent off by a king's messenger in due time the blacksmith arrived and he was immediately seized and thrown into prison to await his trial when the queen saw that she had been deceived she was in despair she tried by every way by tears and entreaties and caresses to move the king but all without avail then she tried by plotting and bribery to gain her brother's release but it was all in vain the day for trial came quickly and the blacksmith was tried and he was condemned and sentenced to be burnt alive by the river on the following day on the evening of the day of trial the queen sent a message to the king to come to her and when the king came reluctantly fearing a renewal of entreaties expecting a woman made of tears and sobs full of grief he found instead that the queen had dried her eyes and dressed herself still more beautifully than ever till she seemed to the king the very pearl among women and she told the king that he was right and she was wrong she said putting her arms about him and caressing him that she had discovered that it was true that her brother had been plotting against the king and therefore his death was necessary it was terrible she said to find that her brother whom she had always held as a pattern was no better than a traitor but it was even so and her king was the wisest of all kings to find it out the king was delighted to find his queen in this mood and he soothed her and talked to her kindly and sweetly for he really loved her though he had given in to bad advice about the brother and when the king's suspicions were lulled the queen said to him that she had now but one request to make and that was that she might have permission to go down with her maids to the river shore in the early morning and see herself the execution of her traitor brother the king who would now have granted her anything anything she asked except just that one thing the life of her brother gave permission and then the queen said that she was tired and wished to rest after all the trouble of the last few days and would the king leave her so the king left her to herself and went away to his own chambers very early in the morning ere the crimson flush upon the mountains had faded in the light of day a vast crowd was gathered below the city by the shore of the great river very many thousands were there of many countries and peoples crowding down to see a man die to see a traitor burnt to death for his sins for there is nothing like men so much as to see another man die upon a little headland jutting out into the river the pirate was raised with brushwood and straw to burn quickly and an iron post in the middle to which the man was to be chained at one side was a place reserved and presently down from the palace and along procession came the queen and her train of ladies to the place kept for her guards were put all about to prevent the people crowding and then came the soldiers and in the midst of them the blacksmith and amid many cries of traitor traitor and shouts of derision he was bound to the iron post within the wood and the straw and the guards fell back the queen sat and watched it all and said never a word fire was put to the pyre and it crept rapidly up in long red tongues with coils of black smoke it went very quickly for the wood was very dry and a light breeze came laughing up the river and helped it the flames played about the man chained there in the midst and he made never a sign only he looked steadily across at the purple mountain where his home lay and it was clear that in a few more moments he would be dead there was a deep silence everywhere then of a sudden before any one knew before a hand could be held out to hinder her the queen rose from her seat and ran to the pyre in a moment she was there and had thrown herself into the flames 
and with her arms about her brother's neck she turned and faced the myriad eyes that glared upon them the queen in all the glory of her beauty glittering with gems and the man with great shackled bare limbs dressed in a few rags his muscles already twisted with the agony of the fire a great cry of horror came from the people and there was the movement of guards and officers rushing to stop the fire but it was all of no use a flash of red flames came out of the logs folding these twain like an imperial cloak a whirl of sparks towered into the air and when one could see again the woman and her brother were no longer there they were dead and burnt and the bodies mingled with the ashes of the fire she had cost her brother his life and she went with him into death some days after this a strange report was brought to the palace by the landing-place near the spot where the fire had been was a great fig-tree it was so near to the landing-place and was such a magnificent tree that travellers coming from the boats or waiting for a boat to arrive would rest in numbers under its shade but the report said that something had happened there to travellers sleeping beneath the tree at night it was stated that two gnats had appeared very large and very beautiful a man gnat and a woman gnat and had frightened them very much indeed noises were heard in the tree voices and cries and a strange terror came upon those who approached it nay it was even said that men had been struck by unseen hands and severely hurt and others it was said had disappeared children who went to play under the tree were never seen again the gnats took them and their parents sought for them in vain so the landing-place was deserted and a petition was brought to the king and the king gave orders that the tree should be hewn down so the tree was cut down and its trunk was thrown into the river it floated away out of sight and nothing happened to the men who cut the tree though they were deadly afraid the tree floated down for days until at last it stranded near a landing-place that led to a large town where the governor of these parts lived and at this landing-place the portents that had frightened the people at the great city reappeared and terrified the travellers here too and they petitioned the governor the governor sought out a great monk a very holy man learned in these matters and sent him to inquire and the monk came down to the tree and spoke he said that if any gnats lived in the tree they should speak to him and tell him what they wanted it is not fit he said for great gnats to terrify the poor villagers at the landing-place let the gnats speak and say what they require all that they want shall be given and the gnats spake and said that they wanted a place to live in where they could be at peace and the monk answered for the governor that all his land was at their disposal let the gnats choose he said all the country is before them so the gnats chose and said that they would have popa mountain and the monk agreed the gnats then left the tree and went away far away inland to the great popa mountain and took up their abode there and all the people there feared and reverenced them and even made to their honour two statues with golden heads and set them up on the mountain this is the story of the popa gnats the greatest gnats of all the country of burma the guardian spirits of the mysterious mountain the golden heads of the statues are now in one of our treasuries put there for safe custody during the troubles though it is doubtful if even then any one would have dared to steal them so greatly are the gnats feared and the hunters and the travellers there must offer to the gnats little offerings if they would be safe in these forests and even the young man must obtain permission from the gnats before he marry i think these stories that i have told stories selected from very many that i have heard will show what sort of spirits these are that the burmese have peopled their trees and rivers with will show what sort of religion it is that underlies without influencing the creed of the buddha that they follow it is of the very poetry of superstition free from brutality from baseness from anything repulsive springing as i have said from their innate sympathy with nature and recognition of the life that works in all things it always seems to me that beliefs such as these are a great key to the nature of a people are apart from all interest in their beauty and in their akinness to other beliefs of great value in trying to understand the character of a nation for to beings such as gnats and fairies the people who believe in them will attribute such qualities as are predominant in themselves as they consider admirable and indeed all supernatural beings are but the magnified shadows of man cast by the light of his imagination upon the mists of his ignorance therefore when you find that a people make their spirits beautiful and fair 
calm and even-tempered loving peace and the beauty of the trees and rivers shrinkingly averse from loud words from noises and from the taking of life it is because the people themselves think that these are great qualities if no stress be laid upon their courage their activity their performance of great deeds it is because the people who imagine them care not for such things there is no truer guide i am sure to the heart of a young people than their superstitions these they make entirely for themselves apart from their religion which is to a certain extent made for them that is why i have written this chapter on gnats not because i think it affects buddhism very much one way or another but because it seems to me to reveal the people themselves because it helps us to understand them better to see more with their eyes to be in unison with their ideas because it is a great key to the soul of the people End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of the soul of a people this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anita roy dobbs boston the soul of a people by harold fielding chapter twenty two death the deliverer the end of my life is near at hand Seven days hence, like a man who rids himself of a heavy load, I shall be free from the burden of my body. Death of the Buddha There is a song well known to all the Burmese, the words of which are taken from the sacred writings. It is called the story of Ma Pa Da, and it was first told to me by a Burmese monk long ago when I was away on the frontier. It runs like this. In the time of the Buddha, in the city of Thawati, there was a certain rich man, a merchant, who had many slaves. Slaves in those days, and indeed generally throughout the East, were held very differently to slaves in Europe. They were part of the family, they were not saleable without good reason, and there was a law applicable to them. They were not hors de la loi, like the slaves of which we have conception. There are many cases quoted of sisters being slaves to sisters, and of brothers to brothers quoted not for the purpose of saying that this was an uncommon occurrence, but merely of showing points of law in such cases. One day in the market the merchant bought another slave, a young man, handsome and well-mannered, and took him to his house and kept him there with his family and the other slaves. The young man was earnest and careful in his work, and the merchant approved of him, and his fellow slaves liked him. But Mapada, the merchant's daughter, fell in love with him, the slave was much troubled at this, and he did his best to avoid her, but he was a slave and under orders, and what could he do? When she would come to him secretly and make love to him and say, Let us flee together, for we love each other, he would refuse, saying that he was a slave, and the merchant would be very angry. He said he could do no such thing. And yet, when the girl said, Let us flee, for we love each other, he knew that it was true and that he loved her as she loved him, and it was only his honor to his master that held him from doing as she asked. But because his heart was not of iron, and there are few men that can resist when a woman comes and woos them, he at last gave way, and they fled away one night, the girl and a slave, taking with them her jewels and some money. They traveled rapidly and in great fear, and did not rest till they came to a city far away, where the merchant would never, they thought, think of searching for them. Here in this city, where no one knew of their history, they lived in great happiness, husband and wife, trading with the money they had with them. And in time a little child was born to them. About two or three years after this it became necessary for the husband to take a journey, and he started forth with his wife and child. The journey was a very long one, and they were unduly delayed, and so it happened that while still in the forest, the wife fell ill and could not go any further, so the husband built a hut of branches and leaves, and there, in the solitude of the forest, was born to them another little son. The mother recovered rapidly, and in a little time she was well enough to go on. They were to start next morning on their way again, and in the evening the husband went out, as was his custom, to cut firewood, for the nights were cold and damp. Mapada waited and waited for him, but he never came back. 
The sun set, and the dark rose out of the ground, and the forest became full of whispers, but he never came. All night she watched and waited, caring for her little ones, fearful to leave them alone, till at last the gray light came down, down from the sky to the branches and from the branches to the ground, and she could see her way. Then, with her newborn babe in her arms and the elder little fellow trotting by her side, she went out to search for her husband. Soon enough, she found him not far off, stiff and cold beside his half-cut bundle of firewood. A snake had bitten him on the ankle, and he was dead. So Mapada was alone in the great forest, but a girl still, with two little children to care for. But she was brave despite her trouble, and she determined to go on and gain some village. She took her baby in her arms and the little one by the hand and started on her journey. And for a time all went well, till at last she came to a stream. It was not very deep, but it was too deep for the little boy to wade, for it came up to his neck, and his mother was not strong enough to carry both at once. So, after considering for a time, she told the elder boy to wait. She would cross and put the baby on the far side and return for him. Be good, she said. Be good and stay here quietly till I come back. And the boy promised. The stream was deeper and swifter than she thought, but she went with great care and gained the far side and put the baby under a tree a little distance from the bank to lie there while she went for the other boy. Then after a few minutes' rest, she went back. She had got to the center of the stream, and her little boy had come down to the margin to be ready for her, when she heard a rush and a cry from the side she had just left, and looking round, she saw with terror a great eagle sweep down upon the baby and carry it off in its claws. She turned round and waved her arms and cried out to the eagle, He, he, hoping it would be frightened and drop the baby, but it cared nothing for her cries or threats and swept on with long curves over the forest trees, away out of sight. Then the mother turned to gain the bank once more, and suddenly she missed her son, who had been waiting for her. He had seen his mother wave her arms, he had heard her shout, and he thought she was calling him to come to her. So the brave little man walked into the water, and the black current carried him off his feet at once. He was gone, drowned in the deep water below the ford, tossing on the waves towards the sea. No one can write of the despair of the girl when she threw herself under a tree in the forest. The song says it was very terrible. At last she said to herself, I will get up now and return to my father in Thawati. He is all I have left. Though I have forsaken him all these years, yet now that my husband and his children are dead, my father will take me back again. Surely he will have pity on me, for I am much to be pitied. So she went on, and at length, after many days, she came to the gates of the great city where her father lived. At the entering of the gates, she met a large company of people, mourners, returning from a funeral, and she spoke to them and asked, Who is it that you have been burying today so grandly with so many mourners? And the people answered her and told her who it was, and when she heard she fell down upon the road as one dead, for it was her father and mother who had died yesterday and it was their funeral train that she saw. They were all dead now, husband and sons and father and mother. In all the world she was quite alone. So she went mad, for her trouble was more than she could bear. She threw off all her clothes and let down her long hair and wrapped it about her naked body and walked about raving. At last she came to where the Buddha was teaching, seated under a fig tree. She came up to the Buddha, and told him of her losses, and how she had no one left. And she demanded of the Buddha that he should restore to her those that she had lost. And the Buddha had great compassion upon her, and tried to console her. All die, he said. It comes to everyone, king and peasant, animal and man. Only through many deaths can we obtain the great peace. All this sorrow, he said, is of the earth. All this is passion which we must get rid of and forget before we reach heaven. Be comforted, my daughter, and turn to the holy life. All suffer as you do. It is part of our very existence here, sorrow and trouble without any end. But she would not be comforted, but demanded her dead of the Buddha. Then, because he saw it was no use talking to her, 
that her ears were deaf with grief and her eyes blinded with tears, he said to her that he would restore to her those who were dead. You must go, he said, my daughter, and get some mustard seed, a pinch of mustard seed, and I can bring back their lives. Only you must get this seed from the garden of him near whom death has never come. Get this and all will be well. So the woman went forth with a light heart. It was so simple. Only a pinch of mustard seed, and mustard grew in every garden. She would get the seed and be back very quickly, and then the Lord Buddha would give her back those she loved who had died. She clothed herself again and tied up her hair and went cheerfully and asked at the first house, Give me a pinch of mustard seed, and it was given readily. So with her treasure in her hand, she was going forth back to the Buddha full of delight when she remembered. Has ever anyone died in your household? she asked, looking round wistfully. The man answered, Yes, that death had been with them but recently. Who could this woman be, he thought, to ask such a question? And the woman went forth, the seed dropping from her careless fingers, for it was of no value. So she would try again and again, but it was always the same. Death had taken his tribute from all, father or mother, son or brother, daughter or wife. There was always a gap somewhere, a vacant place beside the meal. From house to house throughout the city she went, till at last the new hope faded away, and she learned from the world what she had not believed from the Buddha, that death and life are one. So she returned, and she became a nun, poor soul taking on her the 227 vows, which are so hard to keep that nowadays nuns keep but five of them. Footnote. These five vows are, one, not to take life, two, to be honest, three, to tell the truth, four, to abstain from intoxicants, five, chastity. This is the teaching of the Buddha, that death is inevitable, this is the consolation he offers, that all men must know death. No one can escape death. No one can escape the sorrow of the death of those whom he loves. Death, he says, and life are one, not antagonistic, but the same. And the only way to escape from one is to escape from the other, too. Only in the great peace, when we have found refuge from the passion and tumult of life, Shall we find the place where death cannot come? Life and death are one. This is the teaching of the Buddha repeated over and over again to his disciples when they sorrowed for the death of Thariputra, when they were in despair at the swift approaching end of the great teacher himself. Hear what he says to Ananda, the beloved disciple, who is mourning over Thariputra. Ananda, he said, Often and often have I sought to bring shelter to your soul from the misery caused by such grief as this. There are two things alone that can separate us from father and mother, from brother and sister, from all those who are most cherished by us, and those two things are distance and death. Think not that I, though the Buddha, have not felt all this even as any other of you. Was I not alone when I was seeking for wisdom in the wilderness? And yet what would I have gained by wailing and lamenting either for myself or for others? Would it have brought to me any solace from my loneliness? Would it have been any help to those whom I had left? There is nothing that can happen to us, however terrible, however miserable, that can justify tears and lamentations and make them aught but a weakness. And so we are told in this way the Buddha soothed the affliction of Ananda and filled his soul with consolation, the consolation of resignation. For there is no other consolation possible but this, resignation to the inevitable, the conviction of the uselessness of sorrow, the vanity and selfishness of grief. There is no meeting again with the dead. Nowhere in the recurring centuries shall we meet again those whom we have loved, whom we love, who seem to us to be parts of our very soul. That which survives of us, the part which is incarnated again and again until it be fit for heaven, has nothing to do with love and hate. Even if in the whirlpool of life our paths should cross again the paths of those whom we have loved, we are never told that we should know them again and love them. 
A friend of mine has just lost his mother, and he is very much distressed. He must have been very fond of her, for although he has a wife and children and is happy in his family, he is in great sorrow. He proposes even to build a pagoda over her remains, a testimony of respect, which in strict Buddhism is reserved for saints. He has been telling me about this and how he is trying to get a sacred relic to put in the pagoda, and I asked him if he never hoped again to meet the soul of his mother on earth or in heaven, and he answered, No, it is very hard, but so are many things, and they have to be born. Far better it is to face the truth than to escape by a pleasant falsehood. There is a Burmese proverb that tells us that all the world is one vast burial ground. There are dead men everywhere. One of our great men has said the same, I answered. He was not surprised. As it is true, he said, I suppose all great men would see it. Thus there is no escape, no loophole for a delusive hope, only the cultivation of the courage of sorrow. There are never any exceptions to the laws of the Buddha. If a law is a law, that is the end of it. Just as we know of no exceptions to the law of gravitation, so there are no exceptions to the law of death. But although this may seem to be a religion of despair, it is not really so. This sorrow, to which there is no relief, is the selfishness of sorrow, the grief for our own loneliness. For of sorrow, of fear, of pity for the dead, there is no need. We know that in time all will be well with them. We know that, though there may be before them vast periods of suffering, yet that they will all at last be in Nebhan with us. And if we shall not know them there, still we shall know that they are there, all of them, no one will be wanting. Purified from the lust of life, white souls, steeped in the great peace, all living things will attain rest at last. There is this remarkable fact in Buddhism, that nowhere is any fear expressed of death itself, Nowhere any apprehension of what may happen to the dead. It is the sorrow of separation, the terror of death to the survivors, that is always dwelt upon with compassion, and the agony of which it is sought to soothe. That the dying man himself should require strengthening to face the king of terrors is hardly ever mentioned. It seems to be taken for granted that men should have courage in themselves to take leave of life becomingly, without undue fears. Buddhism is the way to show us the escape from the miseries of life, not to give us hope in the hour of death. It is true that to all Orientals, death is a less fearful thing than it is to us. I do not know what may be the cause of this. Courage certainly has little to do with it. But it is certain that the purely physical fear of death, that horror and utter revulsion that seizes the majority of us at the idea of death, is absent from most Orientals. And yet this cannot explain it all, for fear of death, though less, is still there, is still a strong influence upon their lives, and it would seem that no religion which ignored this great fact could become a great living religion. Religion is made for man, to fit his necessities, not man for religion, and yet the faith of Buddhism is not concerned with death. Consider our faith, how much of its teaching consists of how to avoid the fear of death, how much of its consolation is for the deathbed, how we are taught all our lives that we should live so as not to fear death, how we have priests and sacraments to soothe the dying man and give him hope and courage, and how the crown and summit of our creed is that we should die easily. And consider that in Buddhism all this is absolutely wanting. Buddhism is a creed of life, of conduct. Death is the end of that life. That is all. We have all seen death. We have all of us watched those who, near and dear to us, go away out of our ken. There is no need for me to recall the last hours of those of our faith, to bring up again the fading eye and waning breath, the messages of hope we search for in our scriptures to give hope to him who is going, the assurances of religion, the cross held before the dying eyes. Many men, we are told, turn to religion at the last, after a life of wickedness, and a man may do so even at the eleventh hour and be saved. That is part of our belief. That is the strongest part of our belief. 
and that is the hope that all fervent Christians have, that those they love may be saved even at the end. I think it may truly be said that our Western creeds are all directed at the hour of death as the great and final test of that creed. And now, think of Buddhism. It is a creed of life. In life, you must win your way to salvation by urgent effort, by suffering, by endurance. On your deathbed, you can do nothing. If you have done well, then it is well. If ill, then you must in future life try again and again till you succeed. A life is not washed. A soul is not made fit for the dwelling of eternity in a moment. Repentance to a Buddhist is but the opening of the eyes to see the path to righteousness. It has no virtue in itself. To have seen that we are sinners is but the first step to cleansing our sin. In itself, it cannot purify. As well ask a robber of the poor to repent and suppose thereby that those who have suffered from his guilt are compensated for the evil done to them by his repentance. As to ask a Buddhist to believe that a sinner can at the last moment make good to his own soul all the injuries caused to that soul by the wickedness of his life. Or suppose a man who has destroyed his constitution by excess to be, by the very fact of acknowledging that excess, restored to health. The Buddhist will not have that at all. A man is what he makes himself, and that making is a matter of terrible effort, of unceasing endeavor towards the right, of constant suppression of sin till sin be at last dead within him. If a man has lived a wicked life, he dies a wicked man, and no wicked man can obtain the perfect rest of the sinless dead. Heaven is shut to him, but if heaven is shut, it is not shut forever. If hell may perhaps open to him, it is only for a time, only till he is purified and washed from the stain of his sins, and then he can begin again and have another chance to win heaven. If there is no immediate heaven, there is no eternal hell, and in due time all will reach heaven. All will have learnt through suffering the wisdom the Buddha has shown to us, that only by a just life can men reach the great peace even as he did. So that if Buddhism has none of the consolation for the dying man that Christianity holds out in the hope of heaven, so it has none of the threats and terrors of our faith. There is no fear of an angry judge, of a judge who is angry. And yet when I came to think over the matter, it seemed to me that surely there must be something to calm him in the face of death. If Buddhism does not furnish this consolation, he must go elsewhere for it. And I was not satisfied because I could find nothing in the sacred books about a man's death, that therefore the creed of the people had ignored it. A living creed must, I was sure, provide for this somehow. So I went to a friend of mine, a Burman magistrate, and I asked him, When a man is dying, what does he try to think of? What do you say to comfort him that his last moments may be peace? The monks do not come, I know. The monks, he said, shaking his head. What could they do? I did not know. Can you do anything, I asked, to cheer him? Do you speak to him of what may happen after death, of hopes of another life? No one can tell, said my friend, what will happen after death. It depends on a man's life, if he has done good or evil, what his next existence will be, whether he will go a step nearer to the peace. When the man is dying, no monks will come, truly, but an old man, an old friend, father, perhaps, or an elder of the village, and he will talk to the dying man. He will say, Think of your good deeds. Think of all that you have done well in this life. Think of your good deeds. What is the use of that? I asked. Suppose you think of your good deeds, what then? Will that bring peace? The Burman seemed to think that it would. Nothing, he said, was so calming to a man's soul as to think of even one deed he had done well in his life. Think of the man dying, the little house built of bamboo and thatch with an outer veranda where the friends are sitting and the inner room behind a wall of bamboo matting where the man is lying. A pot of flowers is standing on a shelf on one side and a few cloths are hung here and there beneath the brown rafters. The sun comes in through little chinks in roof and wall 
making curious lights in the semi-darkness of the room, and it is very hot. From outside come the noises of the village, cries of children playing, grunts of cattle, voices of men and women clearly heard through the still, clear air of the afternoon. There is a woman pounding rice nearby with a steady thud, thud of the lever, and there is a clink of a loom where a girl is weaving ceaselessly. All these sounds come into the house as if there were no walls at all, but they are unheeded from long custom. The man lies on a low bed with a fine mat spread under him for bedding. His wife, his grown-up children, his sister, his brother are about him, for the time is short, and death comes very quickly in the East. They talk to him kindly and lovingly, but they read to him no sacred books. They give him no messages from the world to which he is bound. They whisper to him no hopes of heaven. He is tortured with no fears of everlasting hell. Yet life is sweet and death is bitter and it is hard to go. And as he tosses to and fro in his fever, there comes in to him an old friend, the headman of the village, perhaps, with a white muslin fillet bound about his kind old head. And he sits beside the dying man and speaks to him. Remember, he says slowly and clearly, all those things that you have done well. Think of your good deeds. And as the sick man turns wearily, trying to move his thoughts as he is bidden, trying to direct the wheels of memory, the old man helps him to remember. Think, he says, of your good deeds, of how you have given charity to the monks, of how you have fed the poor. Remember how you worked and saved to build the little rest house in the forest, where the traveler stays and finds water for his thirst. All these are pleasant things, and men will always be grateful to you. Remember your brother, how you helped him in his need, how you fed him and went security for him till he was able again to secure his own living. You did well to him. Surely that is a pleasant thing. I do not think it difficult to see how the sick man's face will lighten, how his eyes will brighten at the thoughts that come to him at the old man's words. And he goes on. Remember when the squall came up the river and the boat upset when you were crossing here? How it seemed as if no man could live alone in such waves, and yet how you clung to and saved the boy who was with you, swimming through the water that splashed over your head and very nearly drowned you. The boy's father and mother have never forgotten that, and they are even now mourning without in the veranda. It is all due to you that their lives have not been full of misery and despair. Remember their faces when you brought their little son to them, saved from death in the great river. Surely that is a pleasant thing. Remember your wife who is now with you, how you have loved her and cherished her and kept faithful to her before all the world. You have been a good husband to her and you have honored her. She loves you and you have loved her all your long life together. Surely that is a pleasant thing. Yes, surely these are pleasant things to have with one at the last. Surely a man will die easier with such memories as these before his eyes, with love in those about him and the calm of good deeds in his dying heart. If it be a very different way of soothing a man's end from those which other nations use, is it the worse for that? Think of your good deeds. It seems a new idea to me, that in doing well in our life we are making for ourselves a pleasant death because of the memory of those things. And if we have none, or if evil so outnumbered the good deeds as to hide and overwhelm them, what then? A man's death will be terrible indeed if he cannot in all his days remember one good deed that he has done. All a man's life comes before him at the hour of death, said my informant, all from the earliest memory to the latest breath, like a whole landscape called by a flash of lightning out of the dark night. It is all there, every bit of it, good and evil, pleasure and pain, sin and righteousness. A man cannot escape from his life, even in death. In our acts of today, we are determining what our death will be. If we have lived well, we shall die well. And if not, then not. As a man lives, so shall he die, is the teaching of Buddhism as of other creeds. So what Buddhism has to offer to the dying believer is this, that if he live according to its tenets, he will die happily, 
and that in the life that he will next enter upon, he will be less and less troubled by sin, less and less wedded to the lust of life, until sometime, far away, he shall gain the great deliverance. He shall have perfect peace, perfect rest, perfect happiness, he and his, in that heaven where his teacher went before him long ago. And if we should say that this deliverance from life, this great peace, is death, what matter, if it be indeed peace? End of chapter 22「wherein we are dashed to and fro by our passions, saying of the Buddha. It is a hard teaching, this, of the Buddha, about death. It is a teaching that may appeal to the reason, but not to the soul, that when life goes out, this thing which we call I goes out with it, and that love and remembrance are dead for ever. It is so hard a teaching that in its purity, the people cannot believe it they accept it but they have added on to it a belief which changes the whole form of it a belief that is the outcome of that weakness of humanity which insists that death is not and cannot be all though to the strict buddhist death is the end of all worldly passion to the burmese villager that is not so he cannot grasp he cannot endure that it should be so and he has made for himself out of buddhism a belief that is opposed to all buddhism in this matter he believes in the transmigration of souls in the survival of the i the teaching that what survives is not the i but only the result of its action is too deep for him to hold true if a flame dies the effects that it has caused remain and the flame is dead for ever a new flame is a new flame but the eye of man cannot die he thinks it lives and loves for all time he is made out of the teaching a new teaching that is very far from that of the buddha and the teaching is this when a man dies his soul remains his eye has only changed its habitation still it lives and breathes on earth not the effect but the soul itself it is reborn among us and it may even be recognized very often in its new abode and that we should never forget this that we should never doubt that this is true it has been so ordered that many can remember something of these former lives of theirs this belief is not to a burman a mere theory but is as true as anything he can see for does he not daily see people who know of their former lives nay does he not himself often vaguely have glimpses of that former life of his no man seems to be quite without it but of course it is clearer to some than others just as we tell stories in the dusk of ghosts and second sight so do they when the day's work is over gossip of stories of second birth only that they believe in them far more than we do in ghosts a friend of mine put up for the night once at a monastery far away in the forest near a small village he was travelling with an escort of mounted police and there was no place else to sleep but in the monastery the monk was as usual hospitable and put what he had bare house-room at the officer's disposal and he and his men settled down for the night after dinner a fire was built on the ground and the officer went and sat by it and talked to the headman of the village and the monk first they talked of the dacoits and of crops unfailing subjects of interest and gradually they drifted from one subject to another till the englishman remarked about the monastery that it was a very large and fine one for such a small secluded village to have built the monastery was of the best and straightest teak 
and must he thought have taken a very long time and a great deal of labour to build for the teak must have been brought from very far away and in explanation he was told a curious story it appeared that in the old days there used to be only a bamboo and grass monastery there such a monastery as most jungle villages have and the then monk was distressed at the smallness of his abode and the little accommodation there was for his school a monastery is always a school so one rainy season he planted with great care a number of teak seedlings round about and he watered them and cared for them when they are grown up he would say these teak trees shall provide timber for a new and proper building and i will myself return in another life and with those trees would i build a monastery more worthy than this teak trees take a hundred years to reach a mature size and while the trees were still but saplings the monk died and another monk taught in his stead and so it went on and the years went by and from time to time new monasteries of bamboo were built and rebuilt and the teak trees grew bigger and bigger but the village grew smaller for the times were troubled and the village was far away in the forest so it happened that at last the village found itself without a monk at all the last monk was dead and no one came to take his place it is a serious thing for a village to have no monk to begin with there is no one to teach the lads to read and write and do arithmetic and there is no one to whom you can give offerings and thereby get merit and there is no one to preach to you and tell you of the sacred teaching so the village was in a bad way then at last one evening when the girls were all out at the well drawing water they were surprised by the arrival of a monk walking in from the forest weary with a long journey footsore and hungry the villagers received him with enthusiasm fearing however that he was but passing through and they furbished up the old monastery in a hurry for him to sleep in but the curious thing was that the monk seemed to know it all he knew the monastery and the path to it and the ways about the village and the names of the hills and the streams it seemed indeed as if he must once have lived there in the village and yet no one knew him or recognized his face though he was but a young man still and there were villagers who had lived there for seventy years next morning instead of going on his way the monk came into the village with his begging-bowl as monks do and went round and collected his food for the day and in the evening when the villagers went to see him at the monastery he told them he was going to stay he recalled to them the monk who had planted the teak trees and how he had said that when the trees were grown he would return i said the young monk am he that planted these trees lo they are grown up and i am returned and now we will build a monastery as i said when the villagers doubting questioned him and old men came and talked to him of traditions of long past days he answered as one who knew all he told them he had been born and educated far away in the south and had grown up not knowing who he had been and that he had entered a monastery and in time became a pangiai the remembrance came to him he went on in a dream of how he had planted the trees and had promised to return to that village far away in the forest the very next day he had started and travelled day after day and week upon week till at length he had arrived as they saw so the villagers were convinced and they set to work and cut down the great bowls and built the monastery such as my friends saw and the monk lived there all his life and taught the children and preached the marvellous teaching of the great buddha till at length his time came again and he returned for of monks it is not said that they die but that they return this is the common belief of the people into this has the mystery of dharma turned in the thoughts of the burmese buddhists for no one can believe the incomprehensible a man has a soul and it passes from life to life as a traveller from inn to inn till at length it is ended in heaven but not till he has attained heaven in his heart will he attain heaven in reality many children the burmese will tell you remember their former lives as they grow older the memories die away and they forget but to the young children they are very clear i have seen many such 
about fifty years ago in a village named Akshitgan, were born two children a boy and a girl they were born on the same day in neighbouring houses and they grew up together and played together and loved each other and in due course they married and started a family and maintained themselves by cultivating their dry barren fields about the village they were always known as devoted to each other and they died as they had lived together the same death took them on the same day so they were buried without the village and were forgotten for the times were serious it was the year after the english army had taken mandalay and all burma was in a fury of insurrection the country was full of armed men the roads were unsafe and the nights were lighted with the flames of burning villages it was a bad time for peace-loving men and many such fleeing from their villages took refuge in larger places nearer the centres of administration akshitgan was in the midst of one of the worst of all the distressed districts and many of its people fled and one of them a man named mong khan with his young wife went to the village of kabayu and lived there now mong khan's wife had borne to him twin sons they were born at akshitgan shortly before their parents had to run away and they were named the eldest mong yai which is brother big fellow and the younger mong nuje which means brother little fellow these lads grew up at kabayu and soon learned to talk and as they grew up their parents were surprised to hear them calling to each other at play and calling each other not mong giai and mong nige but mong san niyain and ma gawin the latter is a woman's name and the parents remembered that these were the names of a man and wife who had died in akshitgan about the time the children were born so the parents thought that the souls of the man and wife had entered into the children and they took them to akshitgan to try them the children knew everything in akshitgan they knew the roads and the houses and the people and they recognized the clothes they used to wear in a former life there was no doubt about it one of them the younger remembered too how she had borrowed two rupees once of a woman mathet unknown to her husband and left the debt unpaid mathet was still living and so they asked her and she recollected that it was true she had lent the money long ago shortly afterwards i saw these two children they are now just over six years old the elder into whom the soul of the man entered is a fat chubby little fellow but the younger twin is smaller and has a curious dreamy look in his face more like a girl than a boy they told me much about their former lives after they died they said they lived for some time without a body at all wandering in the air and hiding in the trees this was for their sins then after some months they were born again as twin boys it used said the elder boy to be so clear i could remember everything but it is getting duller and duller and i cannot now remember as i used to do of children such as this you may find any number only you have to look for them as they are not brought forward spontaneously the burmese like other people hate to have their beliefs and ideas ridiculed and from experience they have learned that the object of a foreigner in inquiring into their ways is usually to be able to show by his contempt how very much cleverer a man he is than they are therefore they are very shy but once they understand that you only desire to learn and to see and that you will always treat them with courtesy and consideration they will tell you all that they think a fellow-officer of mine has a burmese police orderly a young man about twenty who has been with him since he came to the district two years ago yet my friend only discovered accidentally the other day that his orderly remembers his former life he is very unwilling to talk about it he was a woman apparently in that former life and lived about twenty miles away he must have lived a good life for it is a step of promotion to be a man in this life but he will not talk of it he forgets most of it he says though he remembered it when he was a child sometimes this belief leads to lawsuits of a peculiarly difficult nature in eighteen eighty three two years before the annexation of upper burma there was a case that came into the local court of the oil district which depended upon this theory of transmigration opposite yenangyang there are many large islands in the river these islands during the low water months are 
join to the mainland and are covered with a dense high grass in which many deer live when the river rises it rises rapidly communication with the mainland is cut off and the islands are for a time in the higher rises entirely submerged during the progress of the first rise some hunters went to one of these islands where many deer were to be found and set fire to the grass to drive them out of cover shooting them as they came out some deer fleeing before the fire swam across and escaped others fell victims but one fawn barely half grown ran right down the island and in its blind terror it leaped into a boat at anchor there this boat was that of a fisherman who was plying his trade at some distance and the only occupant of the boat was his wife now this woman had a year or so before lost her son very much loved by her but who was not quite of the best character and when she saw the deer leaping into the boat she at once fancied that she saw the soul of her erring son looking at her out of its great terrified eyes so she got up and took the poor panting beast in her arms and soothed it and when the hunters came running to her to claim it she refused he is my son she said he is mine shall i give him up to death the hunters clamoured and threatened to take the deer by force but the woman was quite firm she would never give him up except with her life you can see she said that it is true that he is my son he came running straight to me as he always did in his trouble when he was a boy and he is now quite quiet and contented instead of being afraid of me as an ordinary deer would be and it was quite true that the deer took to her at once and remained with her willingly so the hunters went off to the court of the governor and filed a suit for the deer the case was tried in open court and the deer was produced with a ribbon round its neck evidence there was naturally but little the hunters claimed the deer because they had driven it out of the island by their fire the woman resisted the claim on the ground that it was her son the decision of the court was this the hunters are not entitled to the deer because they cannot prove that the woman's son's soul is not in the animal the woman is not entitled to the deer because she cannot prove that it is the deer will therefore remain with the court until some properly authenticated claim is put in so the two parties were turned out the woman in bitter tears and the hunters angry and vexed and the deer remained the property of the judge but this decision was against all burmese ideas of justice he should have given the deer to the woman he wanted it for himself said a burman speaking to me of the affair he probably killed it and ate it surely it is true that officials are of all the five evils the greatest then my friend remembered that i was myself an official and he looked foolish and began to make complimentary remarks about english officials that they would never give such an iniquitous decision i turned it off by saying that no doubt the judge was now suffering in some other life for the evil wrought in the last and the burman said that probably he was now inhabiting a tiger it is very easy to laugh at such beliefs nothing is indeed easier than to be witty at the expense of any belief it is also very easy to say that it is all self-deception that the children merely imagine that they remember their former lives or are citing conversation of their elders how this may be i do not know what is the explanation of this perhaps the only belief of which we have any knowledge which is at once a living belief to-day and was so as far back as we can get i do not pretend to say for transmigration is no theory of buddhism at all but was a leading tenet in the far older faith of brahmanism of which buddhism was but an offshoot as was christianity of judaism i have not indeed always attempted to reach the explanation of things i have seen when i have satisfied myself that a belief is really held by the people that i am not the subject of conscious deception either by myself or others i have conceived that my work was ended there are those who in investigating any foreign customs and strange beliefs can put their finger here and say this is where they are right and there and say this belief is foolishly wrong and idiotic i am not unfortunately one of these writers i have no such confident belief in my own infallibility of judgment as to be able to sit on high and say here is truth and here is error i will leave my readers to make their own judgment if they desire to do so only asking them as they would not like their own beliefs to be scoffed and sneered at that they will treat with respect the sincere beliefs of others even if they cannot accept them it is only in this way that we can come to understand a people and to sympathize with them 
it is hardly necessary to emphasize the enormous effect that a belief in transmigration such as this has upon the life and intercourse of the people of their kindness to animals i have spoken elsewhere and it is possible this belief in transmigration has something to do with it but not i think much for if you wish to ill-treat an animal it would be quite easy even more easy to suppose that an enemy or a murderer inhabited the body of the animal and that you were but carrying out the decrees of fate by ill-using it but when you love an animal it may increase that love and make it reasonable and not a thing to be ashamed of and it brings the animal world nearer to you in general it bridges over the enormous void between man and beast that other religions have made nothing humanizes a man more than love of animals i do not know if this be a paradox i know that it is a truth there was one point that puzzled me for a time in some of these stories of transmigration such as the one i told about the man and wife being reborn twins it was this a man dies and leaves behind children let us say to whom he is devoutly attached he is reborn in another family in the same village maybe it would be natural to suppose that he would love his former family as much as or even more than his new one complications might arise in this way which it is easy to conceive would cause great and frequent difficulties i explained this to a burman one day and asked him what happened and this is what he said the affection of mother to son of husband to wife of brother to sister belongs entirely to the body in which you may happen to be living when it dies so do these affections new affections arise from the new body the flesh of the son being of one with his father of course loves him but as his present flesh has no sort of connection with his former one he does not love those to whom he was related in his other lives these affections are as much a part of the body as the hand or the eyesight with one you put off the other thus all love to the learned even the purest affection of daughter to mother of man to his friend is in theory a function of the body with the one we put off the other and this may explain perhaps something of what my previous chapter did not make quite clear that in the hereafter of buddhism there is no affection when we have put off all bodies when we have attained nirvana love and hate desire and repulsion will have fallen from us for ever meanwhile in each life we are obliged to endure the affections of the body into which we may be born it is the first duty of a monk of him who is trying to lead the pure life to kill all these affections or rather to blend them into one great compassion to all the world alike gayuna compassion that is the only passion that will be left to us so say the learned i met a little girl not long ago a wee little maiden about seven years old and she told me all about her former life when she was a man her name was mong mon she said and she used to work the dolls in a travelling marionette show it was through her knowledge and partiality for marionettes that it was first suspected her parents told me whom she had been in her former life she could even as a sucking child manipulate the strings of a marionette doll but the actual discovery came when she was about four years old and she recognized a certain marionette booth and dolls as her own she knew all about them knew the name of each doll and even some of the words they used to say in the plays i was married four times she told me two wives died one i divorced one was living when i died and is living still i loved her very much indeed the one i divorced was a dreadful woman see pointing to a scar on her shoulder this was given me once in a quarrel she took up a chopper and cut me like this then i divorced her she had a dreadful temper it was immensely quaint to hear this little thing discoursing like this the mark was a birthmark and i was assured that it corresponded exactly with one that had been given to the man by his wife in just such a quarrel as the one the little girl described the divorced wife and the much-loved wife were still alive and not yet old the last wife wanted the little girl to go and live with her i asked her why she did not go you loved her so much i said she was such a good wife to you surely you would like to live with her again but all that she replied was in a former life now she loved only her present father and mother the last life was like a dream broken memories of it still remained but the loves and hates the passions and impulses were all dead another little boy told me once that the way remembrance came to him was by seeing the silk he used to wear 
made into curtains which are given to the monks and used as partitions in their monasteries and as walls to temporary erections made at festival times he was taken when some three years old to a feast at the making of a lad the son of a wealthy merchant into a monk there he recognized in the curtain walling in part of the bamboo building his old dress he pointed it out at once the same little fellow told me that he passed three months between his death and his next incarnation without a body this was because he had once accidentally killed a fowl had he killed it on purpose he would have been punished very much more severely most of this three months he spent dwelling in the hollow shell of a palm fruit the nuisance was he explained that this shell was close to the cattle path and that the lads as they drove the cattle afield in the early morning would bang with a stick against the shell this made things very uncomfortable for him inside it is not an uncommon thing for a woman when about to be delivered of a baby to have a dream and to see in that dream the spirit of someone asking for permission to enter the unborn child for to a certain extent it lies within a woman's power to say who is to be the life of her child there was a woman once who loved a young man not of her village very dearly and he loved her too as dearly as she loved him and he demanded her in marriage from her parents but they refused why they refused i do not know but probably because they did not consider the young man a proper person for their daughter to marry then he tried to run away with her and nearly succeeded but they were caught before they got clear of the village the young man had to leave the neighbourhood the attempted abduction of a girl is an offence severely punishable by law so he fled and in time under pressure from her people the girl married another man but she never forgot she lived with her husband quite happily he was good to her as most burmese husbands are and they got along well enough together but there were no children after some years four or five i believe the former lover returned to his village he thought that after this lapse of time he would be safe from prosecution and he was moreover very ill he was so ill that very soon he died without ever seeing again the girl he was so fond of and when she heard of his death she was greatly distressed so that the desire of life passed away from her it so happened that at this very time she found herself incent with her first child and not long before the due time came for the child to be born she had a dream she dreamt that her soul left her body and went out into space and met there the soul of her lover who had died she was rejoiced to meet him again full of delight so that the return of her soul to her body her awakening to a world in which he was not filled her with despair so she prayed her lover if it was now time for him again to be incarnated that he would come to her that his soul would enter the body of the little baby soon about to be born so that they two might be together in life once more and in the dream the lover consented he would come he said into the child of the woman he loved when the woman awoke she remembered it all and the desire of life returned to her again and all the world was changed because of the new life she felt within her but she told no one then of the dream or of what was to happen only she took the greatest care of herself she ate well and went frequently to the pagoda with flowers praying that the body in which her lover was about to dwell might be fair and strong worthy of him who took it worthy of her who gave it in due time the baby was born but alas and alas for all her hopes the baby came but for a moment to breathe a few short breaths to cry and to die and a few hours later the woman died also but before she went she told someone all about it all about the dream and the baby and that she was glad to go and follow her lover she said that her baby's soul was her lover's soul and that as he could not stay neither would she and with these words on her lips she followed him out into the void the story was kept a secret until the husband died not long afterwards but when i came to the village all the people knew it i must confess that this story is to me full of the deepest reality full of pathos it seems to me to be the unconscious protestation of humanity against the dogmas of religion and of the learned however it may be stated that love is but one of the bodily passions that dies with it however even in some of the stories themselves this explanation is used to clear certain difficulties however opposed eternal love may be to one of the central doctrines of buddhism it seems to me that the very essence of this story is the belief that love does not die with the body that it lives for ever and ever through incarnation after incarnation such a story is the very cry of the agony of humanity love is strong as death many waters cannot quench love i and love is stronger than death 
not any dogmas of any religion not any philosophy nothing in this world nothing in the next shall prevent him who loves from the certainty of rejoining some time the soul he loves End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the soul of a people this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the soul of a people by harold fielding chapter twenty four the forest of time the gate of that forest was death there was a great forest it was full of giant trees that grew so high and were so thick overhead that the sunshine could not get down below, and there were huge creepers that ran from tree to tree climbing there, and throwing down great loops of rope. Under the trees, growing along the ground, were smaller creepers, full of thorns, that tore the wayfarer and barred his progress. The forest, too, was full of snakes that crept along the ground, so like in their grey and yellow skins to the earth, they travelled on that the traveller trod upon them unawares and was bidden, and some so beautiful with coral red and golden bars that men would pick them up as some dainty jewel till the snake turned upon them. Here and there in this forest were little glades wherein there were flowers, beautiful flowers they were, with deep white cups and broad glossy leaves hiding the purple fruit and some had scarlet blossoms that nodded to and fro like drowsy men, and there were long festoons of white stars. The air there was heavy with their scent, but they were all full of thorns, only you could not see the thorns till after you had plucked the blossom. This wood was pierced by roads. Many were very broad, leading through the forest in divers ways, some of them stopping now and then in the glades others avoiding them more or less but none of them were straight always if you followed them they bent and bent until after much travelling you were where you began and the broader the road the softer the turf beneath it the sweeter the glades that lined it the quicker did it turn one road there was that went straight but it was far from the others it led among the rocks and cliffs that bounded one side of the valley it was very rough, very far from all the glades in the lowlands. No flowers grew beside it. There was no moss or grass upon it, only hard, sharp rocks. It was very narrow, bordered with precipices. There were many lights in this wood, lights that flamed out like sunsets and died, lights that came like lightning in the night and were gone. This wood was never quite dark. It was so full of these lights that flickered aimlessly. There were men in this wood who wandered to and fro. The wood was full of them. They did not know whither they went. They did not know whither they wished to go. Only this they knew, that they could never keep still. For the keeper of this wood was time. He was armed with a keen whip and kept driving them on and on. There was no rest. Many of these, when they first came, loved the wood. The glades, they said, were very beautiful, the flowers very sweet. They wandered down the broad roads into the glades, and tried to lie upon them, the moss, and loved the flowers. But time would not let them. Just for a few moments they could have peace, and then they must on and on. But they did not care. The forest is full of glades, they said. If we cannot live in one, we can find another. And so they went on, finding others and others, and each one pleased them less. Some few there were who do not go to the glades at all. They are very beautiful, they said, but these roads that pass through them, whither do they lead? Round and round and round again. There is no peace there. Time rules in those glades, time with his whip and goad. And there is no peace. What we want is rest. And those lights, they said, they are wandering lights, like the summer lightning, far down in the south, moving hither and thither. We care not for such lights. Our light is firm and clear. What we desire is peace. We do not care to wander forever round this forest, to see forever those shifting lights. And so they would not go down the winding roads. 
but essayed the path upon the cliffs. It is narrow, they said. It has no flowers. It is full of rocks, but it is straight. It will lead us somewhere, not round and round and round again. It will take us somewhere. And there is a light, they said. Before us, the light of a star. It is very small now, but it is always steady. It never flickers or wanes. It is the star of truth. Under that star we shall find that which we seek. And so they went upon their road, toiling upon the rocks, falling now and then, bleeding with wounds from the sharp points, sore-footed but strong-hearted. And ever as they went, they were farther and farther from the forest, farther and farther from the glades and the flowers with deadly scents. They heard less and less the crack of the whip of time falling upon the wanderer's shoulders. The star grew nearer and nearer. The light grew greater and greater. The false lights died behind them, until at last they came out of the forest, and there they found the lake that washes away all desire under the sun of truth. They had won their way. Time and life and fight and struggle were behind them, could not follow them as they came, weary and sorefoot, into the great peace. And of those who were left behind, of those who stayed in the glades to gather the deadly flowers, to be driven ever forward by the whip of time, what of them? Surely they will learn. The kindly whip of time is behind. He will never let them rest in such a deadly forest. They must go ever forward. And as they go, they grow more and more weary. The glades are more and more distasteful. The heavy-scented blossoms more and more repulsive. They will find out the thorns, too. At first they forgot the thorns and the flowers. The blossoms are beautiful, they said. What care we for the thorns? Nay, the thorns are good. It is a pleasure to fight with them. What would the forest be without its thorns? If we could gather the flowers and find no thorns, we should not care for them. The more the thorns, the more valuable the blossoms. So they said. And they gathered the blossoms, and they faded. But the thorns did not fade. They were ever there. The more blossoms a man had gathered, the more thorns he had to wear. And time was ever behind him. They wanted to rest in the glades. But time willed that ever they must go forward. No going back. No rest. Ever and ever on. So they grew very weary. These flowers, they said at last, are always the same. We are tired of them. Their smell is heavy. They are dead. This forest is full of thorns only. How shall we escape from it? Ever as we go round and round, we hate the flowers more. We feel the thorns more acutely. We must escape. We are sick of time and his whip. Our feet are very, very weary. Our eyes are dazzled and dim. We too would seek the peace. We laughed at those before who went along the rocky path. We did not want peace. But now it seems to us the most beautiful thing in the world. Will time never cease to drive us on and on? Will these lights never cease to flash to and fro? Each man at last will turn to the straight road. He will find out. Every man will find out at last that the forest is hateful, that the flowers are deadly, that the thorns are terrible. Every man will learn to fear time. Then, when the longing for peace has come, he will go to the straight way and find it. No man will remain in the forest forever. He will learn. When he is very, very weary, when his feet are full of thorns, and his back scarred with the lashes of time, great kindly time, the schoolmaster of the world, he will learn. Not till he has learnt will he desire to enter into the straight road. But in the end, all men will come. We at the last shall all meet together, where time and life shall be no more. This is a Burman allegory of Buddhism. It was told to me long ago. I trust I have not spoilt it in the retelling. End of chapter 24. Chapter 25 of The Soul of a People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Conclusion This is the end of my book. I have tried always, as I wrote, to remember the principles that I laid down for myself in the first chapter. Whether I have always done so, I cannot say. It is so difficult, so very difficult, to understand a people, any people, to separate their beliefs from their assents, to discover the motives of their deeds, that I fear I must often have failed. My book is short. It would have been easy to make a book out of each chapter, to write volumes on each great subject that I have touched on. But I have not done so. I have always been as brief as I could. I have tried always to illustrate only the central thought, and not the innumerable divergencies, because only so can a great or strange thought be made clear. Later, when the thought is known, then it is easy to stray into the byways of thought, always remembering that they are byways, wandering from a great center. For the Burman's life and belief is one great whole. I thought before I began to write, and I have become more and more certain of it as I have taken up subject after subject, that to all the great differences of thought between them and us there is one key and this key is that they believe the world is governed by eternal laws that have never changed, that will never change, that are founded on absolute righteousness. While we believe in a personal God, altering laws, and changing moralities according to his will. If I were to rewrite this book, I should do so from this standpoint of eternal laws, making the book an illustration of the proposition. Perhaps it is better as it is, in that I have discovered the key at the end of my work instead of at the beginning. I did not write the book to prove the proposition, but in writing the book this truth has become apparent to me. The more I have written, the clearer has this teaching become to me, until now I wonder that I did not understand long ago, nay, that it has not always been apparent to all men. Surely it is the beginning of all wisdom. Not until we have discarded Atlas and substituted gravity, until we have forgotten Enceladus and learned the laws of heat, until we rejected Thor and his hammer and searched after the laws of electricity, could science make any strides onward. An irresponsible spirit playing with the world as his toy killed all science. But now science has learned a new wisdom to look only at what it can see, to leave vain imaginings to children and idealists, certain always that the truth is inconceivably more beautiful than any dream. Science with us has gained her freedom, but the soul is still in bonds. Only in Buddhism has this soul freedom been partly gained. How beautiful this is, how full of great thoughts, how very different to the barren materialism it has often been said to be, I have tried to show. I believe myself that in this teaching of the laws of righteousness we have the grandest conception, the greatest wisdom, the world has known. I believe that in accepting this conception we are opening to ourselves a new world of unimaginable progress, in justice, in charity, in sympathy, and in love. I believe that as our minds, when freed from their bonds, have grown more and more rapidly to heights of thought before undreamed of, to truths eternal, to beauty inexpressible, so shall our souls, when freed, as our minds now are, rise to sublimities of which we have no conception. Let each man but open his eyes and see, and his own soul shall teach him marvelous things. The End End of chapter 25. Conclusion. End of the Soul of a People by Harold Fielding.